Hello everyone. Welcome to another discussion. Ambassador Suri has a master's degree in economics and has served various diplomatic missions from India in a plethora of places like Cairo, Dar es Salaam, Washington, London, uh, and Damascus. He has also served as India's consul general in Johannesburg. He was India's ambassador to Egypt and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, he has also served as India's high commissioner to Australia. Ambassador Suri has also been a part of the Ministry of External Affairs, heading the West Africa and Public Diplomacy Departments. Recently, in September 2019, the UAE conferred upon him the Order of Zayed II, the second highest civilian award in the UAE. Currently, he is the director of the Center for New Economic Diplomacy. As a hobby and passionately, Ambassador Suri translates books from Punjabi to English. Today's discussion aligns perfectly with what forms a big part of our guest's illustrious career, India's ties with the Gulf countries. Before I hand over to Ambassador Suri, our viewers can note that they can ask questions on the live chat on YouTube, which will be taken up post the session. I would now like to invite uh, Sir to share his insights. Thank you very much. And it's such a pleasure to engage with a young audience, uh, particularly those uh, from the economics and commerce faculties, uh, which is also su a subject that I studied a zillion years ago. Um, I thought, uh, you know, um, it's important for our uh, young uh, colleagues to understand the importance of India's ties with the six uh, Gulf countries, uh, which constitute the GCC. And I'm deliberately leaving um, Iraq and Iran out of it for the time being. And the six countries then are the Saudi, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, and Kuwait. Um, and, and, and there's a reason why I'm doing that, because there's a feeling that uh, we've kind of neglected our ties with these countries for some time. Uh, but let's begin at the beginning. And then as I go forward, I'll uh, uh, perhaps uh, put more of an emphasis on the economics uh, along with the political side. Um, I think it would be fair to say that our ties with the Gulf uh, and with the Middle East generally go back a very long way. Um, you know, um, the, 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 the whole story of the zero uh, traveling from India to the uh, Arab world uh, and, and then taking its own uh, sort of definition over there. The fact that during the caliphate of uh, Harun Rashid uh, in the 10th, 11th centuries, uh, when Baghdad was the center of uh, much of the Arab civilization, um, a lot of Indian classics um, on medicine, on astrology, on astronomy were translated uh, from Sanskrit into Arabic. Um, our Panchatantra fables were translated uh, uh, as Kalila Vadimna and many an Arab child grows up learning about our fables through Kalila Vadimna, which was translated a thousand years ago. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, as we moved forward uh, to the colonial period, um, I think we had a particularly close association uh, with the uh, Arab world broadly and with the Gulf in particular. Uh, Indian soldiers uh, in both the First World War and the Second World War participated uh, uh, broadly in uh, the uh, Middle East. Um, I've seen some beautiful pictures uh, when we were commemorating the centenary of the First World War a couple of years back of Indian soldiers in Jerusalem and on the banks of the Suez Canal uh, and in the deserts of Iraq. Um, there's this beautiful story that when India was itself uh, a few years later in its independence struggle and Mahatma Gandhi was at the forefront, uh, Mahatma Gandhi was coming back from um, uh, London uh, after attending the round table conference and um, the Egyptian freedom struggle at that time uh, or, or was being led by Saad Zaglul Pasha. Uh, and, 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 and he was very keen to meet Gandhiji and uh, uh, the British uh, infamously uh, prevented him from coming to uh, the uh, port city of Ismailia on the Suez Canal, where uh, the meeting was supposed to take place. Uh, but be that as, as it may, as we move forward a few more decades and we come to uh, the uh, post-independence India, um, Nehru in particular uh, was a, a, a great supporter of the anti 
colonial anti-imperial uh, movements. Uh, and this was so a I recall the non-line movement uh, was predominantly put together by the ideas of Nehru and with Nasser and uh, from Egypt and Tito from Yugoslavia then and uh, um, um, Sukarno from Indonesia who came together to, uh, to, uh, to uh, create the movement. What happened during that period then was that uh, India developed a sort of an affinity for uh, the secular states that were coming up like Egypt or, or Algeria or Syria or even uh, Iraq a few years later. And the uh, Gulf uh, sheikhdoms, which were the backwaters in any case at that time, kind of uh, were uh, neglected. And this is a bit sad because if you look at our engagement with the Gulf, um, even going back to the early part of the 19th century, the late part of the um, 19th century and early part of the 20th century. Um, this is before oil was discovered in the Gulf states and before they became super rich. Um, their principal source of income really was pearl diving and places like Dubai or Sharjah or Basra were best known uh, for the pearls that they produced. Uh, and guess what? Uh, it was the Indian merchants from uh, Mumbai or from Gujarat now who would sail down to the uh, Gulf during the pearl diving season. It was the Indian merchants who would give the money to the uh, to the seafarers so that they could load up the supplies in their boats for the two months or three months of the pearl diving season, uh, and and then uh, also be the buyers of those pearls. Um, Right until uh, the Gulf countries became independent, which is sort of around 1970-71, um, they were largely run out of India. Uh, till 1967, um, well, I should correct that, till 1947, when India became independent, um, the Gulf countries, uh, uh, the British agent was in Bombay, not in London. And so the, there was a very strong colonial connection with, with the Gulf countries. Uh, and till as late as 1967, the legal tender in um, Dubai, for example, was the Indian rupee. Um, uh, you know, uh, and even today you'll find old timers who won't say the dirham or, uh, uh, or a rial, but they'll call the currency the rupee. Uh, because that's what it was in Yemen, in, uh, in, in Sharjah, in uh, Dubai, and in other places. Um, so what happened when we were so close to these countries, uh, when, you know, generations of Arabs grew up knowing only Mumbai as the city um, uh, with which they traded. Mumbai was the place that they came for business, they came for healthcare, they came for tourism, and they came for education. Um, the Kerala coast, the Malabar coast was where they came for, again, uh, trade and spices. Uh, and yet, by the time the 70s and 80s came, we found that as these countries were becoming independent, we were looking the other way. And there are several reasons for that when you look at it. One, as I said, is that because of our own uh, situation, we found ourselves closer to the uh, Republican governments, even if they were authoritarian, authoritarian rather than the monarchies, uh, we saw them as more secular, more progressive, and, and certainly more keen to work with India. But I think somewhere also the, the, the religious card came in. And uh, Pakistan certainly as a country that um, was avowedly created in the name of uh, religion, in the name of Islam, uh, made a particular pitch uh, to uh, Saudi Arabia and to uh, UAE and to Bahrain and to Kuwait and the others. Um, and um, um, so you, you, you saw that uh, particularly the Saudis uh, became very close to the Pakistanis. And in 1971 war, um, the um, uh, Saudis actually uh, placed uh, their air force at the disposal of the Pakistanis and, uh, you know, uh, as did UAE to a certain extent. Um, so 
this came as a bit of a shock to us uh, that, uh, you know, uh, King Faisal at that time of Saudi Arabia could place 75 fighter jets at the disposal of Pakistan in a war against India. Um, and of course, the Pakistanis paid back richly by naming Lailpur, which is a major city, calling it Faisalabad. Uh, and in, in around Pakistan, now you have uh, not only a city called Faisalabad after she, uh, King Faisal, but also the Faisal Stadium, the Faisal Mosque, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, uh, so all of that was happening. And, and, and for us, I think in our diplomacy, we kind of put the Gulf countries in the pro-Pakistan basket. Um, and things started changing a little bit uh, post the first oil shock of 1973, uh, when, if you remember, after the uh, Arab-Israeli war in 1973, um, the OPEC cartel was formed. Uh, and as a result of the cartel trying to control the supply of oil uh, globally, the um, prices of oil quadrupled overnight. Uh, and what that meant was that suddenly the uh, sheikhdoms became very rich. Uh, they were suddenly getting large amounts of money. And with that, they could realize their ambitions of building huge amounts of infrastructure. Uh, and that infrastructure became the magnet for uh, many Indian workers and businesses to come to the uh, to the Gulf. And so suddenly you saw a, a, a real influx of Indian uh, uh, migrant workers uh, going to the Gulf and also Indian professionals uh, establishing themselves as uh, those countries uh, developed very rapidly. Um, but again, for the next 10, 15, 20 years, we continued to look at the Gulf largely as uh, a source of energy and largely as a place where there were lots of Indians uh, who were working and uh, sending remittances. We didn't really take a strategic view that this was our near neighborhood. Uh, if we were having a look east policy that involved Singapore and Malaysia and Indonesia and all of those countries, we should also have had a look west policy, uh, uh, which reached out to this, you know, basically you look across the uh, Arabian Sea and that's where the Gulf countries are. Um, and, and I think that really changed dramatically when Prime Minister Modi became, uh, came into power. Um, and uh, he took a number of initiatives, uh, but pre predominantly, I think uh, if I were to uh, define one milestone, it was Prime Minister Modi's visit to Abu Dhabi um, in August of 2015. And the reason it's important is that the last visit before that to Abu Dhabi by any Indian Prime Minister was Mrs. Indira Gandhi in 1981. So for a country that's in our near neighborhood, uh, it was 34 long years before any Indian Prime Minister uh, visited uh, visited that country, and that's also true for several other countries in the region. Uh, so that gives a, gives you a sign, of, an indication of the uh, benign neglect with which we uh, had viewed the region, uh, and and that has changed dr dramatically. So uh, since 2015, uh, Mr. Modi has been back three times, um, twice during my term as ambassador to Abu Dhabi, he visited, uh, including to receive the country's highest civilian award. Um, he's visited Saudi Arabia, he's gone to Bahrain, he's gone to Oman, uh, um, and, and, and those visits have been extremely successful. And we've hosted uh, both the King of Saudi Arabia, King Abdullah, um, and uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, as the chief guests on our mm -hmm. Republic Day. And, and that's a big deal because it's kind of our way of signaling to the uh, rest of the world and to our own people in India that these countries matter. It doesn't have to be the United States or the United Kingdom or France or Germany or Japan, but these countries which are in our near neighborhood also matter. And in fact, uh, it's interesting that when we, uh, in, uh, for our Republic Day uh, uh, celebrations in 2017, uh, we invited the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi. We also kind of broke with standard protocol because under protocol, you would say it could only be the head of state or head of government. Uh, who are invited. So it has to be a president, prime minister, or a king. Uh, but we invited the crown prince because we took note of the reality that the uh, ruler or the king of, uh, uh, of uh, UAE uh, has been disabled by a stroke for the last several years. And effectively, authority is with the crown prince who's running the country. So 
we deal with the person who is actually uh, in power uh, rather than go by protocol considerations. And as a result of that, today we have comprehensive strategic partnership agreement with UAE. We have a strategic partnership agreement with, um, uh, with the Saudis. We, uh, uh, and our relationship is going, growing very significantly. And I'm going to come to a few elements of that. Uh, but let me just give you one example. Um, because Pakistan was always playing the Islamic card in those countries, and it's a fact that these countries, the rulers, were largely conservative Muslim uh, 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 king rulers. Um, the low point for us was 1969 when uh, the OIC was being formed, the Organization of Islamic Conference, uh, uh, the grouping of Muslim nations was being formed. Uh, and, and this was in protest against uh, some vandalism conducted by some Jewish people in Jerusalem against the second holy, third holiest uh, Muslim shrine in Jerusalem. Um, but um, India was invited by Morocco when the first OIC conference was summit was held in 1969 in Morocco in Rabat, India was invited to join. And the reason was India was seen as a major uh, country, but also one with a very large Muslim population, larger than many of the Gulf countries put together, all of the Gulf countries put together. Um, so uh, India was invited, but the Pakistanis lobbied very hard and uh, uh, famously, um, General Yahya Khan, who was the uh, president of um, uh, Pakistan at that time, uh, threatened to storm out uh, and literally blackmailed the uh, hosts into keeping India out. And we felt so rebuffed and insulted that we went into a kind of a deep sulk and said, uh, we'll have nothing to do with you. Uh, and yet in March 2019, 50 years later, the OIC foreign ministers met in Abu Dhabi and uh, the foreign minister of Abu Dhabi, who was going to chair the meeting uh, in a very rare gesture, invited Mrs. Sushma Swaraj, the foreign minister of India, as the guest of honor to the OIC foreign ministers uh, meeting. Uh, I had the privilege of being very closely associated with uh, that very historic moment. And it was, kind of uh, sweet revenge in a sense, because the Pakistanis through, through tantrums and uh, um, their foreign minister called uh, everybody who would care to listen that, uh, you know, uh, we will boycott and we will walk out if the Indian foreign minister is invited to this and we haven't been consulted, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the Emiratis to their credit held firm. Uh, and so on the opening day, uh, you had Mrs. Sushma Swaraj with the uh, UAE foreign minister on the high table, on the dais, uh, and the Pakistani seat uh, was empty because uh, they had chosen not to attend as a form of uh, protest. So the wheel kind of turned back uh, a full circle uh, over, over the 50 years. And I mentioned this because it's a very important show of solidarity towards India, and it gives you an indication of how much things have changed. Um, also, last year, uh, when Article 370 was revoked, the UAE was perhaps the only uh, Muslim country to come out in support of the Indian position, saying this is India's internal matter. Uh, and the rest of the Gulf countries also, nobody really criticized India, uh, uh, which would not have been, which would have been unimaginable uh, even 10, 15 years earlier that, uh, you know, India does this major uh, step and, and nothing really happens. And it's not just that we reached out to the Gulf states. Um, uh, India did, Prime Minister Modi did, foreign ministers did, both Mrs. Sushma Swaraj and foreign minister Jay Shankar. Uh, but I think somewhere the Gulf states themselves had changed a lot. Um, uh, they started realizing, I think, post 9 11, uh, that um, this whole thing of Wahhabi Islam emanating from Saudi Arabia and the impact that it was having in the region had gone too far. Um, for the Emiratis, for example, it came as a shock that for a rich country, three of the hijackers in 9-11 were UAE citizens. And of course, the rest were mostly Saudis. Um, how could this happen? And, 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 and 
that step, they, that trend moved even more strongly when the so-called Arab Spring happened in 2011 in Tunisia and in Egypt, uh, when long-standing regimes of um, Ben Ali and uh, Mubarak were uh, toppled. But the governments that came in their place were of a very Islamic hue. Uh, and this uh, posed a bit of a threat to the conservative monarchies who said, if you're going to get elected under an Islamic card, uh, then that can kind of undermine the legitimacy of, say, the Saudi rulers or others. Uh, but also, there was a feeling in UAE in particular, and also in Saudi Arabia, that this whole notion of political Islam in the guise of Muslim Brotherhood as a political party, for example, is the starting point of a slippery slope. And before you know it, you will be going more and more radical, more and more fundamentalist, and you don't know where you will end up. And that <clears throat> completely runs counter to the vision of the leadership of these countries to become more modern, more progressive societies. And, and so I think it's important for um, us to realize that going beyond our stereotypes of the uh, Gulf people as uh, you know, uh, uh, guys with beards like mine and wearing uh, white robes, uh, beneath that uh, uh, exterior uh, is actually, uh, many of them are very modernizing, very progressive in their, in their outlook. And you know, much has been said about Saudi Arabia under um, uh, Crown Prince uh, Sheikh uh, Mohammed bin Salman about, you know, women being able to drive and films coming back to theaters and even pop concerts being held. Again, something which would have been unimaginable five or 10 years back that Saudi Arabia could move so quickly in this direction. Um, but if you look at UAE again, um, here's a country, uh, Abu Dhabi in particular, which was very conservative. Um, and yet, they today have a minister for tolerance whose job it is to tell people that we need to be respectful of other religions, uh, uh, um, that we cannot be complacent about the idea of religious tolerance. Um, they had uh, last year, I think in February, uh, uh, a unique event where the Pope uh, Francis from uh, Vatican came to Abu Dhabi and the Sheikh of Al-Azhar, which is the highest religious authority in, in a sense, uh, uh, came, they came together and signed something called a document of human fraternity. Um, we were pleasantly surprised when Prime Minister Modi asked for a Hindu temple in Abu Dhabi and uh, we got received permission, not only for a temple, but for a grand temple uh, to come up in Abu Dhabi. Um, and, and, and the most recent thing that I saw was that they're building something called House of Abrahamic uh, Religions. Uh, and uh, within the same complex, you would have a mosque, a church, and a synagogue. I think it's important for us to understand the, import, the significance of this because that's how much these countries are changing. Uh, to a more tolerant, more liberal view of uh, religion as a personal matter, as opposed to a state, uh, a state matter. Uh, and in that pragmatic uh, mode, they don't look at India as a Hindu country. And they don't see a, a relationship with Pakistan only on the grounds of a religious uh, a notion that because Pakistan is Muslim, therefore it is a, it is a strategic uh, ally. Uh, to the contrary, the fact that you have so many jihadi groups in Pakistan makes it a liability because now these countries don't want any of that jihadi element coming in. So suddenly what we find is Indians become the preferred expatriates uh, in the Gulf countries uh, as opposed to, to uh, those from Pakistan or even Bangladesh or, or, or others. Um, so the Islamic card that worked in uh, terms of defining uh, elements of the relationship uh, for a good 20 years or so, I think has lost its currency. Uh, and uh, what you have now in place is a much more uh, pragmatic, interest-oriented uh, relationship where we look at uh, energy, we look at markets. I, I mean, from the Gulf point of view, India is important. We are going to be the largest uh, consumer of energy for many, many years to come. 
uh, um, our markets are going to be uh, markets for them. Um, they have they are wealthy in terms of capital, uh, and so they can make investments into India, which will produce returns for them. Uh, and certainly, they see a large, stable India as a contributor to stability in the region overall. Um, and 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 so. Um, because they have changed and we were kind of slow in recognizing how quickly they have uh, changed, we have a much stronger basis for the kind of relationship that is developing today. I would just put one caveat or one word of caution. Uh, and that is what, uh, you know, some things that happened in the last four or five months when um, several members of the Hindutva fringe groups uh, made some particularly nasty comments about Muslims, about Arabs, about um, Arab women. Um, and there was a real sense of consternation uh, in influential sections in the Gulf, uh, because that's not how they see India. They have always seen India as a tolerant country. Um, I have had uh, ministers uh, from those countries talk to me that they want to understand they, how much they admire the fact that India, despite having the world's second or third largest Muslim community of 180, 190 million, uh, has sent virtually nobody to fight for ISIS, whereas smaller countries like Tunisia uh, have sent thousands, or even countries in Europe like Belgium has sent hundreds, or France has sent hundreds uh, to fight for uh, ISIS. What's, what's India doing right? that Indian uh, Muslims are not prone to that kind of uh, 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 an attraction uh, from a, a jihadi uh, group like, uh, like ISIS. Um, and, and so I think um, it's important for us um, and for you uh, uh, young people to note that uh, while we have uh, made a strategic investment in our relations uh, with the Gulf, uh, and Prime Minister Modi personally has made a huge investment in our relationship. Um, some of that is being undercut uh, by the rhetoric of uh, the uh, fringe groups, um, and, and, and that is being noticed. And I just hope that um, uh, you know the leadership and others will will do what they can to uh, bring it under check. Finally, I just want to spend a few minutes on what are India's interests? Why is the Gulf strategic for us? Um, at one level, you know, we could say it's the diaspora. Um, we have 9 million Indians, 90 lakh Indians in the Gulf, uh, out of which 34 lakhs are in UAE alone. Uh, I want you to think about it. UAE's total population is less than one crore. It's about 9.5 million or a bit less. So we are 35% of that country's population. There are four Indians for every Emirati. Uh, the, there are less than a million Emiratis. There are 900,000 Emiratis, and there are 3.4 million Indians. That's how dominant the presence of India is. And those Indians, some of them at the top end, um, are billionaires, are millionaires. Uh, they form a real bridge for trade and commerce between our countries. Let me give you an example. There's the Lulu Group. They are the largest retail group in the Middle East. And they have hypermarkets and supermarkets across the region. Uh, it's owned by a, a gentleman called Yusuf Ali from uh, Kerala. Uh, and uh, uh, just his import bill from India of, of uh, fresh fruits and vegetables and rice and pulses and all of that is 2,500 crores. So 2,500 crores of Indian exports happen because of one business group. Um, there are others, uh, you know, you've seen Soba. Well, Soba as a real estate company, but they're based in, uh, in, in Dubai. Um, uh, they're headquarters in Dubai. Um, you've seen the lifestyle um, stores in uh, shopping malls. The uh, gentleman who owns them, the Jagtiani family, are in Dubai. Um, the Aster Healthcare, which is uh, expanding into hospitals, uh, are again uh, based out of UAE and so on. Uh, so, so I think it's important for us to note that the NRI community in the uh, Gulf is now emerging as a significant investor into India, into sectors like tourism, hospitality, retail, manufacturing, 
real estate, etc. But the majority, the overwhelming majority of those nine million Indians in the in the Gulf uh, are really blue collar workers, um, and between them they send close to $56 billion a year in remittances, $56 billion. Last year, according to World Bank data, in I think the most recent figures I've seen are for 2018, India received about $79 billion of remittances, and out of that, $56 billion came from the Gulf. For students of economics, these play a critical role in helping us maintain our balance of payments uh, stability. Um, they um, make a real impact in states like Kerala and Punjab and uh, Andhra Pradesh from where many of these guys have gone because the money that they send back keeps many a household afloat. If you look at typically a family of four or five, um, well, nine million Indians there means they are supporting 40 million people back home. Four crore people depend on that. Um, but moving beyond the diaspora, beyond the NRI community, energy security is crucial for us. 60% of our energy imports come from the Gulf. Um, so any uh, issues in supply from there would really hurt us. And what we've been able to do because of our closer relations over the last few years, we managed to get our first oil concessions uh, in UAE, in the lower Zakum Basin, which is a producing field from which we get a chunk of oil. Uh, we got a new uh, site uh, in, in onshore. We got one in Oman. We've set up our first strategic petroleum reserve, which is important to understand because should there be an outbreak of hostilities or anything else, and the sea lanes get closed, our industry would starve without oil. So we're building up a strategic reserve, and the first uh, two of those are again coming up in collaboration with Abu Dhabi. Um, India's largest refinery, um, a $60 billion project for Maharashtra, is a joint venture between Adnoc from Abu Dhabi and Aramco from Saudi Arabia. Each are going to put up 20, you know, a, a, a lot of money to make that refinery happen. Um, as students of economics, I would have posed you a question. Which are our top Who's our top trading partner? Which are our top three trading partners? And you know, intuitively you'd think of US, China, Japan, Germany, UK, the big economies, the G7 countries. So I'm going to give you this surprise that the GCC six countries are our largest trading partner. They are larger than the European Union combined. It's over $100 billion of trade last year. Um, just with UAE, just with that one country, and do check out these numbers um, after I finish. Um, I think our trade last year was in excess of $60 billion. What that means is that UAE, as a tiny little country, is our third largest trading partner after the US and China. And it's the second largest destination for Indian exports after the US. Our exports last year were upwards of $30 billion. 32 billion, if I remember correctly. Um, increasingly, these countries are looking at India as a destination for their investments. So when we set up the National Infrastructure Investment Fund, um, which is a kind of our sovereign fund to invest into uh, hard infrastructure, the first billion dollars from overseas came from the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. And they have now invested more billions of dollars into highways, into renewable energy, into telecommunications, into logistics and ports and petrochemicals, and hopefully going forward in, even in airports. And of course, in our equities markets. Um, the other important uh, uh, element which is emerging is defense and security. Uh, both defense and security are important. On the defense side, I think there's an understanding that um, uh, we have shared interests, that the Arabian Sea um, is a common interest and the Gulf is a common interest for our uh, requirements. And India, as we uh, grow more capable in our defense uh, uh, role, uh, we are seen as a net contributor to security in the region. 
Um, and, and, and so we are being welcomed over there. In fact, our first uh, agreement was with Oman, where we can use uh, naval uh, port facilities uh, for refueling our ships, et cetera. Uh, and, and that's crucial. But also on the security side, um, there's a time that Dawood and his gang could use Dubai as their base of operations and operate with impunity and make for the Mumbai attacks or for other things. That's no longer possible. Uh, uh, the kind of intelligence sharing that we have, and we don't publicize this, uh, but on terrorist groups, because we see a common agenda in fighting terrorism. Uh, so, so uh, you know, uh, our, our own agencies say today that perhaps our best cooperation or the top five is with countries like UAE and Saudi Arabia, uh, because they are equally committed to stamping out uh, radicalization and fundamentalism and extremism. Um, so the criticality for us today, whether we look at it as from a human perspective, our diaspora over there, whether we look at it in terms of the hard financial interests, $56 billion in remittances, two thirds of our energy, um, largest trading partner, or we go into the more sophisticated areas of defense or security or intelligence sharing or others. Uh, to my mind, there is no uh, doubt that the uh, Gulf is critical for our interests. And it's important that we um, recognize this. Uh, and that's what I really wanted to uh, share with uh, your group today, that uh, when you look at the world around you, don't uh, look at stereotypes, see how much has changed and see where things are headed. Um, and, and if you can, um, well, perhaps maybe invest in learning some Arabic as well, which is what I did. Thank you very much. A pleasure uh, to chat with you and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, truly an enjoyable and enriching session, sir. Uh, we'll move on to some pressing questions. Firstly, is there a middle ground wherein India can hope to keep its historic ties with Iran intact while effectively also exploring its newfound ties with USA and the GCC, given the polarized world we're living in at the moment? Well, we've actually done that um, um, with varying degrees of success. Um, right until uh, the last round of sanctions that President Trump uh, uh, imposed on Iran. We actually were one of the few countries that had a waiver to continue to buy Iranian oil. Uh, we uh, remain very actively engaged with Iran. Uh, Foreign Minister Jayashankar, I think, uh, went to, uh, to Tehran in December, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and so both at the, uh, and, and Chabahar port, uh, which is an entry point into Central Asia and Afghanistan, uh, it gives an alternate route to Afghanistan, uh, which is a landlocked country. Um, the Chabahar port in uh, Iran has come up despite the U.S. sanctions because the U.S. also agreed that this was something that we needed to do uh, for the benefit of Afghans and others. Um, and, and, and so I think the real um, challenge for our diplomacy and the success of our diplomacy is the extent to which we are able to preserve the autonomy of our own decision-making uh, for our interests. Um, and mostly we are able to do that. Occasionally you run into a kind of obstacle that uh, President Trump uh, uh, imposes in our path. Uh, but uh, we've been remarkably successful in the fact that we have equally close ties with both the Saudis and the Iranians. Uh, even though they may not talk to each other. And we have equally close ties, for example, with the Iranians and the Israelis, even though they may not talk to uh, e each other. So, so, so uh, for us, uh, the whole uh, challenge of diplomacy is not to get into a position of having to pick either or, uh, but to try to do both uh, or more uh, wherever possible. Moving on, uh, talking uh, as you had spoken about the Wahhabi uh, Wahhabi institutions uh, in uh, during the session. So uh, recently, Saudi Arabia has had this uh, two fifty million dollar investment in India, sending its preachers to set up Wahhabi institutions. 
in India so that the Muslim population in India, which is quite significant, as you mentioned. So uh, these guys, uh, you know, they look at uh, Saudi, the Gulf countries as the main source of uh, inspiration or falling back towards. So do you think it, uh, it has a lot of tangible impact uh, in the short or the long run? First, I would encourage you to check your facts. Um, tell me where this $250 million recently came. What is the source of that information? Uh, and uh, check whether that, in, uh, that money is coming from official sources or from, from private channels. Uh, I'll tell you because we've had those conversations. Um, today, there's a fight within Saudi Arabia against the Wahhabi uh, nature of that uh, uh, regime that it had acquired uh, post-1979. Um, I drew your attention to the fact that um, Sheikh Mohammed bin Salman as the crown prince and effectively the person in charge uh, is, uh, is, is himself embarked on a huge project for liberalization. He's building this futuristic city called Neom he is, uh, you know, uh, as I said, the, the, the this rate at which change is happening in Saudi Arabia today is remarkable. Uh, and and he, he, his intent is to make Saudi Arabia a more normal country. Now, when you've had a, a, a theocracy, uh, a clergy which has been used to power, it is going to take a while before they can be wished away. But in our conversations uh, with uh, uh, the, the leadership in those countries, there is no question that they would support any fundamentalist, radical uh, ideologies to come or flourish in India, let alone finance them. You would still have some cases of individuals, rich individuals, who are able to send money through an account in Switzerland or in uh, uh, Jersey Islands or uh, somewhere to a particular mosque. But we have, a, we have very strong laws against that now to, to, to curb that. But I want to leave this thought with you first. I would strongly check into the sources of my statement that $250 million of funding, um, see where that came from, how recent is it? And who said it? Okay, uh, important because yes. because we have a common interest in, in fighting that. So basically, uh, it was from private investors, as you had mentioned. So uh, the main purpose. So private was... investors' money doesn't come to Wahhabis uh, to, to support Wahhabism. There are some people who are religiously inclined and are rich, and so when. Uh, clergyman goes to them and says, Bhai, man, ek, I want to make a new mosque for my community. Will you help me? Um, they say, yeah, we'll give you $20,000 or whatever uh, as a donation. Uh, but that's not to say that, you know, that it's the Wahhabism that is being exported. Because I think the big trend for you guys to take note is Wahhabism is being rolled back in Saudi Arabia itself. And that has profound implications uh, for the entire region, um, for how um, not only Islam is practiced, but how it is perceived by many people. And, and, and that, you know, groups like ISIS, for example, which take up the far end of this, uh, the ideology or Al Qaeda or others are at complete loggerheads with the uh, uh, with, with the the uh, um, uh, regimes uh, in these countries. So this conflict was exactly what was trying to be uh, was being explored. That uh, at the at the country's stance is that Wahhabism should be rolled back, but some private people, uh, some private investors uh, would rather fund things. But uh, moving will, on, to... if it if it comes out, they will get into trouble with their own leaderships because the leadership has zero tolerance for this kind of activity. Uh, moving on to some questions uh, from the live stream. Sheen uh, asks, considering the current situation, what do you think about the health and livelihood prospects of India's blue-collar workers in the Gulf and the future outlook for India-Gulf migration itself? 
Okay, I, it's a really good question. And uh, let me try to answer it in three parts. The first is, there's a short-term crisis. Um, uh, as you've seen from the Vande Bharat flights coming back from the Gulf, but also just uh, Kerala as a state has registered 450,000 people, four and a half lakh people who uh, have expressed an interest in returning back to Kerala from the, from the Gulf. Um, there's a severe economic contraction. Uh, and, uh, you can see that impact in Dubai and Sharjah and Abu Dhabi and Riyadh and everywhere else. Um, and a uh, uh, lot of projects uh, are not being completed, are being shelved. A lot of businesses are going under uh, because of a double whammy of uh, the coronavirus and uh, the uh, low oil prices, which have really affected uh, these countries. Uh, so, so between them, there's a there's a, the, a major economic contraction underway. So in the short term, I would certainly see a lot of Indians coming back because they've lost their jobs, uh, and 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 now the states have to uh, address that issue. Uh, one of the initiatives that the government has taken is to try and capture the skills, uh, skill profile of the people who are coming back, and create a portal where they can be uploaded, so that our own industry can make use of uh, of the experience and talent which is coming back from the Gulf. And you should be able to know that this is a person who can drive a forklift or who, can, uh, who has worked on highways or who uh, has worked in the retail sector or whatever. The second aspect of this is uh, that there is a structural change happening in uh, the Gulf countries themselves. Um, for many years, any young Emirati or Saudi could expect a government job. Uh, and it would be a well-paying, easy-going uh, job. Um, and they didn't have, work, have to work too hard. But those days are over. Populations are growing. The number of young, peop young locals in those countries uh, is, is, is growing. And so all of the Gulf countries, and in particular Saudi Arabia and Oman, and to an extent UAE, have um, uh, embarked on a Saudiization or an Omanization uh, uh, kind of policy, which means locals first. Uh, and, 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 and that's a structural shift happening. In Saudi Arabia today, um, uh, you are able to see young Saudis work in the retail sector, uh, which was never previously the case. Uh, these are positions which are relatively seen as low paying and sort of exclusively for expatriates. Uh, in Oman today, um, you have some Omanis who are actually driving taxis. Uh, never happened uh, before. And coming back to Saudi Arabia, the fact that women are driving today or are able to drive means that many of the women who needed drivers who are mostly from South Asia um, do not need those drivers. So I think there's a structural shift happening where the demand for unskilled blue collar workers uh, is likely to shrink somewhat. Along with that is a third trend which is happening that many of these uh, uh, societies are moving up the technology ladder um, and, and they're becoming more sophisticated uh, in their requirements. So one of the things that I initiated with the UAE uh, was a skill mapping project where we see can we align our skill development programs uh, developed by the National Skill Development Corporation, NSDC, or the Ministry of Skills and Development with the job requirements in the Gulf. Uh, what a, in practical terms it means is we identified 18 vocations. It could be a painter, a welder, a bricklayer, uh, an electrician, a carpenter, um, etc. Uh, and, and the UAE, for example, now specifies that you must have this certificate to be an electrician, uh, this level of training. So we worked with NSDC to align training programs and give certificates that are accredited and accepted with the UAE authorities, which means that when somebody goes with that training and that certificate from India, he doesn't join the work stream at the bottom end as an unskilled person, but gets a wage premium and moves up the value chain. Uh, and, and, and that 
uh, pilot project that we did with UAE was so successful that now the Saudis have also come into that. And so NSDC is also doing a similar project. So I think for us, we need to recognize that while Indians will probably remain the preferred expatriate workers in the uh, Gulf, particularly in the blue collar jobs, we need to uh, do more to uh, create the skills base, um, in, including in what might seem as menial uh, jobs, but say um, domestic workers or nannies or uh, elder, uh, care for elders and so on, elderly people, um, geriatric care uh, are areas where if we provide some relevant training, then uh, people from our country can get uh, productive jobs in, uh, over there. Uh, but yeah, overall, uh, uh, right now it's a grim situation. Uh, before we move on to the next question, there's a follow-up from Sheen regarding your answer. Uh, she says that uh, you spoke about the domestic skill portals. Uh, do you think that India has the scope to absorb this reverse brain drain? India has the uh, uh, capacity to absorb it. And um, uh, I think uh, particularly if you talk to Indian industry, uh, you hear uh, complaints that many of the migrant workers have gone back to the villages and suddenly uh, you have industries um, uh, or certain sectors of the economy which are short of skilled workers. So I think that this portal could help uh, those industries in uh, recruit uh, the kind of uh, workers they need. But I think it's important also to understand an, uh, a socio-economic aspect of this. Uh, and we see it, uh, I'm in Punjab, we see it here, and, and, in, and we see it in Kerala. So in Kerala, um, you have had uh, an outflow of uh, uh, migrants uh, post the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, so several hundred thousand uh, people from the Northeast and UP and Bihar and Orissa who are working in the construction or retail or hospitality sectors have left. And you have a lot of people from the Gulf coming back into Kerala. Now, the jobs that have been vacated by the domestic migrants, can they be taken up by the returnees from the Gulf? Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, because sometimes people are willing to perform lower category jobs overseas, but not in their own uh, home states or home or in their own cities uh, because of um, perceptions of what that uh, holds in society. Um, so, uh, you know, you'd see somebody sweeping the streets in Dubai, but unwilling to do that in Trivandrum, uh, the same person. Uh, and, 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 and this is true across uh, other states of India as well. I mean, I've seen Punjabis do menial jobs in the United States and Canada, which they would never consider doing uh, over here uh, and, and so on. So unless we have a socioeconomic reform in this, where work becomes dignified because it's work uh, and, and, and we stop classifying work in a, terms of strata of society, I think you will continue to have these uh, aberrations. Uh, the next question, uh, Himanshu asks that if the infighting within the Gulf were to worsen, how do you feel that should India navigate that? You know, uh, Himanshu, it's a good point. And every now and then we are approached uh, directly or indirectly by one party or another that, hey, you guys have a role to play in the region and why don't you be more um, uh, proactive in trying to uh, bring uh, conflicting parties together. Um, we've generally kept our nose out of other people's uh, business. Um, uh, so take the current situation where there's a really nasty conflict between Qatar on one side and uh, Saudis and Emiratis on the other. Um, it would be tempting to think that we can intervene and resolve it. I don't think so. I think uh, these are very personalized um, conflicts. And uh, we, if Indian foreign policy is to serve Indian national interests, then our interests lie squarely in maintaining 
good ties with the Qataris and the Saudis and the Emiratis rather than being perceived in one camp or the other, or in, even in terms of making efforts to patch up that may not get anywhere. So I think uh, I'd spoken about this previously that we uh, maintain good relations with Iran and we maintain good relations with the Saudis, uh, but we don't see ourselves uh, as of now uh, having uh, enough leverage to make a difference in conflict resolution. Uh, I think we are still several years away from being able to play that role, if at all we choose to. Uh, the last question for today, uh, Asta asks that the, the relations India has had with Gulf countries uh, mostly has stemmed from economic need till now, which is from in the energy sector. But uh, in turbulent times like these, can these relationships uh, be expanded to serve national security purposes? Well, I think I, I alluded to that. I think it, it would be um, uh, uh, short-sighted to say it's just energy. Uh, I've uh, outlined the other key areas that we have. Um, and when we talk about national security, energy security, of course, is a part of uh, national security. Uh, but so are our strategic petroleum reserves a part of our national security uh, strategy. Uh, but going beyond that, uh, I think the kind of trade linkages, the kind of investment linkages, the kind of remittances that we are getting, all of that plays a role. Um, I think as we uh, move closer, uh, and, and again, you know, it, it, these are relationships in which it takes time for trust and confidence to develop. With each other. And that's why you start doing joint naval exercises or defense exercises or others, get the defense guys to talk to each other, work together, understand, speak the same language, uh, establish interoperability of systems and so on. So my sense is we are several years away from that, uh, but certainly we've taken the first few steps down that road. So that wraps up the wraps up the session for today. Uh, I would like to thank Ambassador Navdeep Suri once again on behalf of the Economic Society SRCC for taking time out and uh, giving us an enriching and in, uh, experience and session today, sharing insights from his time in the Gulf countries. Thank you, sir. Absolute pleasure. All the very best. Stay safe.